All righty. So thanks again for everybody for joining us today. We definitely appreciate your time. Uh, today's webinar is going to be on the productivity time machine, or how to bring the AECO industry up to speed. So a couple of things first. Everybody's going to be in mute during the presentation. However, I will have the questions box as well as the chat box open during the entire presentation. So if anybody has any questions, send it right in. If I'm able to answer it at that point in time, I will. Otherwise, I'll make sure I answer it at the end. So a couple of little things to get started with first. So Microdesk, for those who aren't uh, familiar with us, we are an AECO industry consulting firm. We were established in 1994. We have 12 locations across the U.S. as well as international in the U.K. And we have over 140 AECO technology consulting specialists and software developers on staff. So people like myself who actually have a background in the industry. So as for me, the presenter, my name is Peter Marchese. I'll be running the show today. I've worked as an architect for about 10 years, and I've been doing consulting for going on 12 now. i worked with a lot of different firms different countries, different industries, and my focus has been on doing process, emerging technologies, and figuring ways around things that uh, don't work in the normal route, workflow. <coughs> cool. So let's get started. Now, our agenda today is going to be going over what some of our current industry trends are, uh, looking at some of the productivity findings that we have, and looking at different solutions for growth. Now, for a lot of the data that we have here, what we're going to be working, uh, looking at is reports from the Smart Market Report, the McGraw-Hill. Use that a lot, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. But there's also some reports from McKinsey & Company, as well as KPMG, that are very beneficial and have a lot of great information. The McKinsey one is one that we'll be focusing on the most. Now, however, I do want to ask everybody in the audience just a couple of quick questions to get an idea of who I'm talking to, make sure I'm focusing things for everybody. So I'm just going to ask three different poll questions. So launch the first one here. Alrighty. A good mix of people. Good. And are you currently using any BIM or mobile applications or tools on your projects? <coughs> Perfect. Thank you. And then the last one here, does your company have a technology roadmap? So what I'm asking for about that is, do you have a plan for what you want to be able to achieve or deliver or the tools that you're going to use? So like right now, we're not doing anything with virtual reality, but in the next three years, we want to be able to offer that or utilize that. Perfect. Good to see a lot of people are in progress on that. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I definitely appreciate your input on that. <coughs> so let's get rolling. So now, looking at where we are with our industry as a whole, like how we're working on things, how we're able to achieve things, some of the trends that we're seeing is companies that are taking advantage of UAVs. I've been presenting on this and flying for a while. The example that I'm showing here is from a company, uh, Brassfield and Gorey. Their VDC group actually estimated that on the project that you're looking at here, they were able to provide a 75% time savings by doing site surveys with the drone as opposed to solely by uh, the traditional means. So we're seeing more and more companies look at this for large-scale surveys, not necessarily looking to replace people or the traditional scanning or survey method, but it's augmenting it. So you could be able to do it much faster and much more uh, often as opposed to sending people into the field. We're also seeing 3D printing start to come to the fold. 
So what you're looking at there on the left is from the Philippines. They actually 3D printed a 1,500 square foot suite for our hotel. This included bedrooms, living room, and a spa with a big 3D printed jacuzzi tub. And essentially they print up a, a couple of inches, then they put in the uh, plumbing, then they continue to print up. And the finished product, this is actually quite nice. The image on the right is actually from Dubai. And what they actually did was they 3D printed an office suite. And essentially they sort of a, a mixture of prefab and 3D printing, but they felt that they had a 30, sorry, 50% cost savings in labor alone compared to conventional methods. And Dubai is actually looking to do now 25% of their construction using 3D printed by 2030. Uh, sorry, 2030. So new technologies being put to use. We're also seeing more robotics come to the fray for large-scale industry where they're actually making uh, vehicles now that have no cab or no uh, human interaction with them from uh, local, as well as machines like on the right that can go through and do demolition. So that's actually using water pressure to remove concrete, dissolve it essentially from a wall, leaving the rebar there. And that rebar can then be reused, it can be destroyed, it can be taken down, but it makes it much cleaner and much easier to work with. From there, we're seeing more Internet of Things take advantage of. So whether it's from a safety standpoint, on the left-hand side, we're seeing that inside of a hard hat that can track things like uh, fumes or gases that aren't perceptible to people, as well as location. And on the right, for a structure. So that way, we're not finding issues like that cracked beam by happenstance or luck. We're able to track that automatically by embedding that into the concrete or applying it to the surface. Then other trends we're starting to see more of is generative design. Not that we're offloading the actual design process to a computer, but we're taking advantage of a computer's processing power to feed us information to help organize the data to point us in a direction and help and ensure that our designs are working with the best possible information. In this case, this is looking at the Autodesk office in Toronto. They use generative design to cycle through thousands of layouts that optimize uh, daylight, personal space, personal preferences, and came up with a specific design that matched all the qualities that they were looking for. Again, it doesn't replace the person. It helps augment their workflow. Now, with all of those cool technologies, all of those different things that are great and being used, they were still having a lot of problems within the construction industry. And the thing is, the tools by themselves are awesome. And the people that are taking advantage of it, the forward thinkers or the leaders, that's great, but that's still more pockets. It's not everybody. It's not uh, industry-wide. So when we start to look at the industry as a whole, <coughs> So construction industry has about 7% of the world's working age population, which works out to be about 220, different, uh, 220 million people. So it's one of the largest sectors from a business standpoint in the world's economy. When we look at that from a numbers standpoint, there's 10 trillion spent on construction-related goods or services every single year. Now, when we start to talk about the process itself, one of the things that we run into is that there's a lot of inefficiency. Now, again, we just looked at some tools like the augmented reality and the, uh, the, the computational design. That helps us with efficiency, but it's still not widely used yet. So when we're looking at projects, this is coming from McGraw-Hill, we're seeing that typically on a construction project, we have 40% material waste. Owners are expecting to face added cost on 80% of the projects. And when we talk about a project's timetable, the average schedule overrun is about 20%. So if you say that your project is supposed to be, you know, 10 weeks, it's probably going to end up at 20, uh, sorry, 12 weeks. So when we look at the average. And add to that, owners are expecting or seeing an average cost increase from the initial proposals. So no matter how cool the tools are, if we're not using them wholesale or we're not using them correctly, we're running into a lot of issues like this. And one of the things that we're looking at is this from a productivity standpoint. So I'm switching over to some of the information from the McKinsey report now. Now, the McKinsey report focused specifically on productivity. 
And the nice thing was it didn't just look at it from a US standpoint, or it didn't just look at it from a specific kind of construction. It's actually a very in-depth report. So if you want to read it, and I definitely recommend that you do, it's about 120 pages. Uh, there is a Cliff Notes <laughs> version that uh, summarizes it in about 20. But what they look at is how are we moving forward, and what are the issues that are holding us back, and then what are the things that we can do to actually correct this and make it better. So when we look at the productivity here, we're looking at sort of starting off at a consistent, you know, 100 there. And then as we move forward from 95 in this table, we're seeing how could the construction industry, it's not able to keep pace with other industries, with other economies. Now, in this specific one, we're comparing it against manufacturing. And there's a reason for that. Manufacturing was able to take advantage of a lot of different technologies, whether it's from digital, whether it's from assembly line, or just being able to make things much more consistent. They're able to grow much faster and be more productive from a hours of work standpoint. And there are possible, there is the chance that we can make up to this. Now, when we look at the difference here. <coughs> That difference between where the total economy is and where construction industry is. If we could increase construction to catch up to that, that would add value to the industry of about 1.6 trillion a year. So the equivalent of that would be the uh, boosting the global GDP by 2% a year. It is possible, but this is where our industry as a whole is right now. Now, when I look at it as a whole, what this means is that we're looking at it from all the different sectors of construction. So we're looking at things from a total construction, including building, civil, industrial, and specialized. Now, if you look at the bottom numbers there, so where it says 23, 21, that's the percent of construction sector value added. Building construction is about 23%. That varies, but that's pretty much holding hold to the 100 there. Now, what we're seeing, though, is that the specialized contracting, the components of the building construction, so that would include the uh, framing, the roofing, the glazing, drywall, painters, those specialty contractors, those are the ones that are not being as productive. And we're not saying they're not working hard. What we're talking about here is that are they as efficient? Are they making as much profit as they can? Because they are smaller firms, there's some issues that can tend to hold them back. And when we look at things from again, more of a wholesale <clears throat> approach as opposed to looking at it from the different divisions, when we look at the larger companies in each country, so these are looking at the, the construction average in that country, versus the largest construction firms. There's a large gap there. The smaller firms, are, in general, are less productive than the larger firms. And it kind of makes sense. Part of the reason for this is that they are not able to afford, <coughs> they're not able to afford all of the R&D. They're not able to take advantage of getting things in bulk. So the economy of scale. Some of what's happening with the technology today that is going to help with us can alleviate that. But as it is right now, there is a discrepancy between the average company and the largest, and the people who we typically would see as a subcontractor versus, say, a GC or somebody who owns the whole process. So an example in that would be somebody who does construction work for commercial, where you have a lot of different trades coming in and maybe somebody who does residential, where it's one company that just handles the entirety of that process. Now, if we're looking at a specific location, <coughs> so what we're looking at right now is from the US, and this is going from 1995 to 2015. The US does have some government regulations that are helping with things. So, but it's not wholesale. It's not like the UK that said every government project has to be BIM from this point forward. It's more piecemeal based on the city or region or division. 
but in 2006, the GSA mandated that new projects designed for its public buildings, they have to use BIM. And for their facility management, there has to be an open standard for that. Now, what they were able to do, though, is they found that the cost savings on one pilot project using the technology that they mandated paid for the cost of another nine pilots in that first year. So we were able to see that benefit. And in a survey by the uh, Associated General Contractors of America in 2016, 21% of the respondents said that they were investing in labor-saving equipment. 13% said they were looking at off-site prefabrication, but only 7% in BIM. So again, we're, we're seeing little trends here and there, but it's not wholesale yet. And part of the problem with this is, again, we have very complex construction sites. The, and because a lot of the smaller companies, they're not able to afford the economies of scale or to put the money into the technology investments, the R&D. Now, when we look at other countries, a little smaller, but same problems as us. So in this case, we're looking at Singapore. Right away, you'll notice that there's a big difference in that graph. Now, part of this is because of what the government was able to put into place. So in the mid-2000s, <clears throat> they put in a concerted effort to alleviate some of their construction problems. So they aim to raise this between 2 to 3% annually between now and 2020 by mandating the use of technology and investing into R&D wholesale. So Singapore has also put into place a BIM electronic submission system for their projects. There's a couple of places in the U.S. I know of that have a BIM submission for reviews, whether it's the Department of Buildings or Safety. But again, it's more piece -built. Standards are part of the problem. But they also have a program from 2015 that promotes the specific technology and off-site construction. So they're actually looking at stepping up adoption of 35 different technologies that they've organized into seven clusters for R&D. And that includes things like advanced materials, 3D printing, BIM, VDC. So they really are focusing on that. And they're really pushing, as well, prefabrication and automation. So they've actually built the world's tallest 40-story pre-finished modular concrete condominium. So different countries focusing on certain things. Again, because they're a smaller country, they can actually push new things through a little bit faster. But still, it's possible. You can see that change in direction based on applying new technology and making sure that it's enforced and pushed. <clears throat> now, if we cut back to just sort of productivity as a whole, we compare ourselves to some of the other uh, disciplines or industries that are out there. Again, here's different tools that are going back and forth. Mining kind of comes up and down depending on where the technology is. You can see the overall economy kind of hanging out in the middle there. Manufacturing, wholesale, and retail, those are both keeping place, and part of that is based on technology. They were a very quick to move to digital, so a lot of places now have a much more consistent pipeline for services as well as for materials. They're able to tell exactly where things are. If anybody here has ever ordered something online before Christmas, you can track that, you know exactly where it is and where, when it's going to be there. But for a lot of our construction projects, we can't do that. You know, if we're talking about where certain materials are, we might not know where they are, even if they're on our job site. So taking advantage of the different technologies that other industries have taken advantage of. Uh, the part of this that tends to come across as the most surprising, though, is the agriculture one. And when we look at this, there's a couple of different reasons for that. <clears throat> when we're talking about agriculture, a lot of that is leveraged because of scale. So they've been able to automate a lot of processes. And in some cases, it's from the bioengineering to increase the yields. But as we look through all of these, you know, scale's a big part. Taking advantage of technology is a bigger part. And when we're looking at agriculture as an example, one of the things they're doing is they're taking advantage of UAVs. So a lot of places now, not just in the US and many other countries too, are looking at using UAVs and thermal imaging to actually review the site, to see things that we might not be able to see with our naked eye, 
and in some cases even when we can, our site might be too big to have somebody track it regularly. So by going out and actually flying it, scanning it, and reviewing it, now you can go out and do targeted approaches to your fields. And again, they're automating just about anything. So for the things that are going out for planting or picking, they can go out there too. And it's not just the agriculture. When we look at farming in general, we're starting to see a lot more robots in there as well. By going <laughs> digital in many respects for uh, the milk industry, they're able to allow the cows to work on their own schedule. Part of this is based on transponders that they wear in the neck, which is not unlike the uh, Fitbits that most of us tend to wear. It's able to do step counts. It's able to see where they are. It allows them to be identified, so that way when they walk in, when they feel like it to get milked, they can track that. They can actually see how each cow is feeling. They can monitor the quality of the milk and the frequency. And the other robots ensure that they always have access to hay and that the floor is always clean. Again, by taking advantage of the tools, it's not removing jobs. It's changing jobs. It's allowing people to spend their time doing other things to be more efficient. And when we start talking about in terms of the technology, you know, we're looking at a robot there on a farm, we're talking about tracking our material on site. The, the idea is can technology really change things? Can it really change the way that we work? And I saw this the other day and I thought it was hilarious. In the 90s, our parents were telling us don't get in cars with strangers and don't meet people that you talk to on the internet. And if you look at where we are now, we're summoning strangers from the internet to get in their car. You know, if you want to talk about an industry that has been completely transformed by technology, look at the ride sharing. You know, between Uber, Lyft, and you know, other smaller companies, that has completely transformed that. And it was just a little bit of technology at the right place at the right time. So yes, technology really can change a lot of things if we take advantage of it and if we pursue it and implement it correctly, which is sort of the key thing. With that, <clears throat> how can we bring the AECO industry back to the future? How can we change that direction of that line to catch back up to where the regular economy is? Well, both of those reports do have some ideas, and they don't involve the flux capacitor. So the McKinsey & Company report focuses on seven different areas that can boost the productivity. Now, the nice thing is they're not just saying here's some seven areas. What they've actually done is they've gone into detail on each of these. And they've also broken it down by saying, okay, well, of these items, this is how much of a savings we feel this component can do. This is the impact on productivity that I feel that that line item can have. So when we start to look at things like the collaboration and contracting, that's an 8 to a 9% impact on productivity. And again, 8 to 9% doesn't seem like a whole lot. But just remember how much that was. <clears throat> when we talk about the difference between the, uh, the productivity in the beginning, that 1.6 trillion. So when we're looking at things, we're talking about design and engineering, the actual aspect of creating our content, modifying that to be a little bit more of a, you know, to be less of a design intent and more of this is how they're actually going to construct it to streamline it and ensure that we're doing more coordination. On-site execution, focusing on, okay, well, how can we streamline this process? How can we make sure that everybody knows exactly where everything is and where everyone else is? When we talk about technology, though, that tends to be the biggest one. And in some cases, the sharing and the platforms that we work with can be the issue. <clears throat> So there was one project in the U.S. It was a tunnel project. It involved almost 600 vendors. But the contractor that was working on it put in place a specific platform that involved that managed the bidding, tendering, contract management. They were able to work out that that workflow that they created saved the team more than 20 hours of staff time per week. In addition to that, it cut down the time to generate reports by 75% and sped up the transmittals by 90%. Think about how much that would equate to on your projects. In another case, 
of a $5 billion rail project saved more than $110 million in boosted productivity by using certain automated workflows for the reviews and approvals. Now, if you're thinking about automated workflows taking too much effort or being too much work, most of the tools that are out there that are cloud-based for coordination probably have something built into that. And the ones that don't, it might actually be able to be added to. So again, if you think about something that we have as consumers, it's pretty basic. There's an If This Then That app on your phone. There's a Microsoft Flow app. If I want to con start creating workflows or automating processes, we can do that for our own things. But not many people take advantage of that in their professional workflows. But it's there if we want to take advantage of it. Now, to focus on two specific aspects here. <clears throat> now, in terms of the digital technology, the new materials, and the advanced automation aspect of that report, <clears throat> one of the main ones here is to invest in a innovation office and team. And if you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. If you're looking to take advantage of new technology, make sure that you're not just you know, throwing money or tools at the wall and hoping some of it sticks. Make sure that you actually have an innovation or a digital team to actually focus on it. Make sure it's being used correctly. So come up with standards, document those standards, and then enforce those standards. Another one is making 3D BIM universal. A lot of what we're going to see here, and I'm going to cover again at the end, is making things consistent, having to change things over and over and over again. On one project, you have to do it this way. On another project, you have to submit it another way. And some of these are industry-wide recommendations. So we're getting closer to having 3D BIM be as a universal deliverable. We're not, we're not quite there yet. But one of the recommendations is to owners, because they can drive that, making sure that you have a standard and universal delivery that you ask for can really help out and make things downstream more consistent. Another one there is focusing on introducing UAVs or drones for scanning, monitoring, and mapping. The technology is out there. The regulation has been organized, so that way it's easy for people to get in and make sure they're doing it, excuse me, doing it legally. And so start looking at that. The tech can be used for a multitude of different aspects, from design through construction. It just depends on the discipline of the person who's using it. big one here is using digital collaboration and mobility tools. So one of the questions I asked in the very beginning with the poll was, are you using mobile tools? Most of the tools that are available now for mobile are either subscription-based or free. And the free ones usually tie into something that you've already taken advantage of or bought. But it allows you to work from anywhere. It ensures that your team is not on the island and is not, not telling you what's going on simply because there wasn't a way to do so. So it's, this is one of those things that you almost can't not do now. It's too easy to, to, to disregard it. <clears throat> now the next one is a little bit more future-based. Uh, they're talking about mobilizing 5D BIM across the project lifecycle with augmented or mixed reality interfaces. Uh, if anybody here has seen my presentations or had the the benefit of taking a look at the Microsoft HoloLens. Think of that as like a mixed reality interface, where you're looking at a building and you're actually looking through the wall and seeing digital information overlaid. Now, this is one of those things that's sort of a next step for what we're doing. The technology is technically there. You've got the Daiquiri smart helmet that's coming out. But it's definitely more of a, in five years, we'll really start to take advantage of this. But all of the work that we do with BIM now that's something that can feed into that. As an owner, if you actually have an intelligent model that can be used for facility management or building maintenance, think about how easy it would be for your maintenance staff to walk around and look through and see exactly where your pipes are, where the ducts are, without having to pop ceiling tiles, without having to drill through walls. That's essentially one of the benefits of that. It's both safer and more efficient. And then the Internet of Things. So have that one slide showing where things could be connected from a safety standpoint. But more and more things, just from a consumer level, are then trickling into the professional level. 
So the things that are being used in construction just have to be set up correctly and securely, which is probably the biggest thing right now. But they're suggesting that we take more connect control of this. And in some cases, the NFC communication, that could be just a method of tracking the content on our site. That 40% waste that we had in the beginning on our construction projects, how much of that is because we couldn't find something? It got damaged while shipping, or that we didn't realize we had it, or it wasn't where we needed it to be. Being able to track things on a job site is very beneficial. And this is one of the things that we can do to do so. And then the, one of the big ones here is analytics. All of the data is out there. We just have to start taking advantage of it, listening to it, and organizing in a method that can feed us the direction that we need to make sure we are being as efficient as we need to be. And then implementing automation equipment on sites. So whether that automation is controlling the, uh, the field work remotely, like they're doing a lot in Japan right now with uh, Kamatsu for the Olympics, <clears throat> or if it's something more along the lines of doing prefab, where you have a location on site or nearby where you're building things in a much more controlled environment to take advantage of that economy of scale. We're doing everything on an assembly line as opposed to in dangerous conditions. Now the other one here is reskill the workforce. So this one kind of ties into the last one. We're talking about taking advantage of new technology, but how do we do that if we're not making sure we know how to use it? Some of this is saying build an apprenticeship model. So in many cases, that's the way it already is. You have people that are coming up through the trades, but they're learning how something has always been done as opposed to learning how it is being done now. And what they're focusing on is in developing a frontline training to ensure that the knowledge retention and management is there. So we really want to make sure that people are understanding how things are going to be taking advantage of, to know where the technology is going, to know how to take advantage of it and be more productive. And since in most cases, we're not going to send somebody to training for three weeks to learn one new thing, it's introducing uh, electronic training or cloud-based training. You know, I just need to learn this one thing. Let me hop online, watch this video, and now I understand the aspect of that. And we're seeing that more across the board from design all the way into construction. So rather than doing sort of the old way of sitting in the classroom for several days in a row, it's kind of like being, going to college where you show up for a class and you take one day. So we're here for an hour, we learn this, and then I come back in a couple of days or a week later and I learn the next step. We're breaking it up. And in some cases, we can treat it like Netflix and sort of binge watch and binge learn the whole thing. But the biggest part of here is making sure that we have a mix of classroom and field-based training to make the uh, learning more effective. So one of the examples I like to give during uh, my VR presentations is that they've actually found for uh, people who are learning how to weld, using the virtual reality to learn how to weld, those students were much more effective and were able to learn faster and get job placement faster than the people who only use traditional uh, uh, training. The thing was, the people who used VR used it to augment, they used it in addition to the traditional training. So it wasn't replacing it, it was adding to that. So same thing, you can teach somebody everything in the classroom, but they also need to learn how to do it in the field to really drive that home and to make sure they understand. <clears throat> and then from that, making sure that you have an internal sort of training session. Now, the benefit of this is that you're documenting what's going on, and that's going to come up again in a bit. So if you do have a strategy for how you want to train, what, what information is important to your company, you want to either create an internal sort of, as they put it, academy, or you want to do some method for people to have a knowledge sharing. So this is what we found works best. These are the things that we found cause problems. So you're trying to make sure that you're being consistent. You're not having everybody try to find their own way. <clears throat> Two of the major ones here, again, taking advantage of that new technology, digitizing the workflow, and reskilling that workforce to make sure that they can take advantage of all those new tools. 
Now, on the other side, we have the KPMG Global Construction Survey. And one of the things that they looked at was they found there were three key steps to benefiting from new technology opportunities. And they broke it down into three things. First thing, make sure you get the basics right. Building the DNA into your DNA, so basically data and analytics, and developing that technology and strategy and vision. So that was that other question I asked in the polls. Now, how this works out <coughs> is establishing controls. So most people here, if you've heard of BIM or seen the BIM presentation, you've probably heard the adage, garbage in, garbage out. And what they are looking at from a control standpoint is ensuring that you actually have a model. You've actually got sort of rules. So if I'm pulling things in, how am I using it? I need to make sure that I have a standard. So because I can have the best data, but I don't have a model or a control on how to read it, that data doesn't produce any good results. Or I could have a perfect organization of how I deal with it, but my information is all missed. So I have to make sure I understand that. From there, I need to make sure that all this information I have can actually be used. I need to make sure that my tools can actually communicate with one another. A lot of the a lot of the focus on a lot of presentations recently over the last couple of years has been focused on data silos. So if you've seen anything on BIM 360, one of the things that Autodesk is focusing on is ensuring that BIM 360 as a service or as a suite can communicate amongst each other, can work with different tools. So that way you're not locking your information over here and now it can't be used over there. So part of this is ensuring that whatever you're going to be working with know, can it read my information from this project? Can I get my data from this source into this one? I need to make sure that I'm not locking my information away. Otherwise, I can't use it. <clears throat> now, the data and analytics is a big one. <clears throat> Most of the projects that we're working on now, there's a lot of data in there. And this isn't just inside the model. Uh, one of the examples from the McKinley report, they actually showed how a specific contractor, they took advantage of the analytics from their engineering division, but not from the models. They used the data that they already had from their email traffic, from the drawing revisions, their information on the team composition and some human resources performance data, and they were able to organize that. So that basically gave them a read on who's doing what, how busy they are, what's going on, and by making some changes, they were able to find productivity improvements from 25 to 30%. So again, think of your firm. What could you do with another 25 to 30% productivity? You know, if you had that much more time, if you were that much more effective at your work from a company standpoint. So doing data analytics is not something that most of us were trained for. If we went for construction or architecture or engineering, but it's something that a lot of firms are investing in because of the benefits and because all of our projects now are so data rich. So the more we get into BIM, the more information that we put in there, the more we move into the cloud where everything get, can be tracked, the more information, the more we can do with that data. <clears throat> and then possibly the biggest one here is just developing a strategy and a vision. You can have all the best tools in the world, but if you don't have a plan to use them, you're going to run into problems. So big one here is identifying what your objectives are. What do you want to do? How do you want to get there? What are the roadblocks that you feel your team is going to run into? And it's what you know you're going to run into, whether it's from getting approval, finding the budget, things like that. You're always going to find uh, unknown ones as you progress, but having a plan on that. And one of the things after that is creating that roadmap, identifying what you're trying to do. <clears throat> you know, and every six months to a year, re revisiting that roadmap. How are we doing with this? Where did we find any additional roadmaps? Are we on track to achieving our goals? And for a lot of these things, it's ensuring that it's coming from the top down. You, know, you can kind of push stuff like this up. But most of the decisions to adopt this kind of technology, to adopt these kind of workflows, that has to come from the top down. You have to have buy-in from leadership to ensure that it's actually going to be uh, implemented. So 
for this kind of thing, you want to identify performance objectives. You want to, if you're going to be working with KPIs, you want to go with that. And you want to discuss how you're going to take advantage of the different tools and what you want to get out of them. Now, all these tools are great, and all of these benefits are real. And typically, the barriers that we're going to find the most is, again, coming down from that process, from a lack of perceived standards or uh, how to adopt it. <clears throat> so again, from the, from the McKinsey report, the most often ranked issue here was that there was no internal process already. Second one is that there's no industry standard. So if we end up waiting for the industry standard to tell us what to do, at that point, we're already playing catch up. So if you look at what other people are doing, whether it's going from networking events, uh, educational events like maybe AU or BIM Forum, or talking to consultants like myself, we can point you into the direction of what others are doing and explain what the pros and cons are for this. Because just because there's no internal process now, that shouldn't hold you back from creating your internal process, from looking at what you can do to actually achieve the results and the benefits, to solve what your pain points are, to get past what the issues are, that you currently have. Because when we look about, you know, why should we do this? <coughs> the field is changing. You know, technology is forcing us to evolve things that have been pretty stagnant for quite a long time. And for the construction industry to catch up, it's going to need to evolve with the technology. It's going to start needing to take advantage of all these tools, not in pockets, you know, a couple of leaders here and there, but wholesale as an industry. And we've already seen this happen with other areas where larger companies have swallowed up smaller ones. We've seen it in retail and we've already seen it with certain construction firms that have gone through and bought their own design firms and smaller construction firms to take everything in-house. And they've become very efficient because of that. And additionally, when we looked at this slide again, that gap there, that 2% of year, that was equivalent to the GDP of Canada. And they estimated that increasing the construction in the industry's value by that 50 to 60% doing those seven things, that could add 1.6 trillion a year. So again, why should we change? Money, efficiency, and staying in business. And if you are gonna go back to the future, Apparently, it makes sense to build your construction vehicles out of a DeLorean. 